Well, good morning and good day to everybody. And welcome back to the presidential seminar series uh, that CIB is uh, offering and we are hosting it through Purdue University. As you all know, the theme for uh, this semester is Distinguish Women Researchers in the Built Environment. And indeed, it is our pleasure today to have Dr. Ruvini Ediri Singh. She's a senior lecturer in the School of Property, Construction and Project Management at RMIT University in Australia. Let me briefly uh, recount her uh, achievements thus far and before I hand it over to her. So as I mentioned, Dr. Ruvini Adir Singh is a senior lecturer at the School of Property, Construction and Project Management at RMIT University in, in Melbourne, Australia. She is a former vice chancellor, a research fellow and an experienced researcher in digital innovation in building and construction. Ruvini has a strong track record of collaborating with research partners and also with industry and the community to make an impact. She has demonstrated research leadership by securing a growing volume of grants and prestigious fellowships. So far, Ruvini has secured over $4.78 million in research funding and has been awarded several research awards. Ruvini is a passionate and effective advocate for diversity and inclusion. As the co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusions Advocacy Group at the School of PCPM uh, at RMIT, she leads teams to promote diversity beyond gender. She's an active member of RMIT's Athena Swan DIAG. She is the deputy Director chair of RMIT's Women Researchers Network. Uh, she's the chair of Institute of Electrical and Engineers, Women in Engineering, uh, Victoria's Victorian section. As a local and international committee member, she has been actively advocating for gender diversity in the engineering profession since 2014 through IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization. So no wonder her topic today reflects women in construction, that is holistic investigation of pipelines, leaks, and lessons from women in engineering. So please welcome Professor Edressing it. Ruin, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think I should make a correction. I'm not a professor yet. I'm a I'm doctor. Um, so thank you. And very good morning to everybody, those who are joining from Purdue University. And good day to everyone joining from elsewhere. Um, so it's my pleasure to be in this meeting today. And I'd begin with the acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Cooling Nations on whose unceded lands I'm hosting this meeting. I also recognize the traditional owners of the countries where you all work today and the First Nations people present in this meeting. Um, so this is the overview of my presentation. I will be giving a little bit of introduction to RMIT and myself. I think Mark covered it very well uh, already, so I'll be sort of um, skipping that bit. See, I, and then I'll be talking about the uh, specific funding I have received to uh, work on this Women in Construction. Particularly, I'd like to touch base on CIB Vistas funding. And, um, then we'd look at the construction industry, how it looks like for working women. Um, then I'll be talking a little bit about the need of a holistic investigation of the pipeline leaks. And we'll be touching base on some root causes. We are not gonna go detail into this because there's plethora of research already in that area. And we'll be talking about some of the strategies that are existing and also I'd like to talk a little bit about some initiatives and engagement activities that I'm doing as part of Women in Engineering um, participation. And then we'll be concluding with some uh, directions for future work. Now, if you were in World Building Congress 2022, this building should uh, sound familiar to you. This is the Green Brain Story Hall where we had the World Building Congress in. RMIT is a multi-sector university of technology, 
design and enterprise with global presence has it has been in operation in Asia Pacific for 135 years. Um, so th these are some of the uh, statistics about RMIT's global outreach. Um, I'd not go into detail of that. Um, there's something relevant to our topic today. RMIT um, has been ranked world's number one university for diversity, reducing inequality particularly in Times Higher Education Impact Rankings 2023. Particularly Sustainable Development Goal 10, reduced inequality was the um, dimension that they've been looking at. Um, this is a remarkable outcome, particularly RMIT has been established as the Working Men's College of Melbourne in uh, 1887. Now, um, Mark covered it very well about myself. So I'm a mid-career academic. Um, uh, well, I my research is in Internet of Things, BIM, digital uh, twins, AI, um, machine learning, blockchain. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher um, coming from Bachelor of Engineering, specialized in computer, engin computer engineering and PhD in computer science from Monash University in Australia. So I've been applying this in facility management, construction management, uh, work health and safety, life cycle an analysis and sustainable practices. So these are some of the pictures from my favorite topic, which is called Smart Safety West Project. Um, obviously, women in construction is not my co not my one of the core research areas, but um, I've been a passionate advocate in gender diversity um, since my Bachelor of Engineering. And um, as Mark mentioned, I'm, I'm active in this space in engagement uh, and other initiatives. So my Women in Construction research is relatively new, new. I would like to acknowledge the funding support from three sources that helped me establish this research area. So RMIT Research and Innovation Funding, one of them is uh, Enabling Impact Platform Funding and also RMIT Career Ignite Funding. Um, and particularly VISTA, CIB VISTAS funding which uh, helped me connect with global researchers and to be mentored by international senior advisors like Mark and Patricia. So this is a collaboration um, across four countries uh, where universities are listed here, as you can see. And on my right-hand side, this is the uh, founding members of this project. And our new addition is Jenin. I think she's on call, Jenin from Purdue. She's been an amazing contributor to the team as well. Um, so I'm mostly presenting the early findings of this ongoing research, um, which, is, which has three stages. So um, let's have a look at what construction industry look like for working women. Um, Women are equally represented in the workforce globally. So if we look at statistics around the four countries, they are, uh, it's, it's fair to say that women are equally represented in the economically active population. Um, and gender equality has a global and national strategic priority as well. For example, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number five specifically says achieve gender uh, equality and empower all women and girls by 2030. So that's the target. And in Australia, particularly, we have a legislation, Gender Equality Act, uh, federal one, 2012, and also state level 2020, um, which is particularly targeting Victorian public sector. So there are policies and guidelines. Um, and what does our industry look like? So if we look at the female representation in the construction industry, um, these are the numbers. We've been looking at um, 30 years and 36 years of data. Um, on average, um, across four countries, uh, the USA, the UK, Australia, and Brazil, 11% of the construction workforce is female. Um, well, 
the numbers are poor. But let me ask you a question. These words, are they familiar to you? Underrepresented, non-traditional, masculine, homogeneous, white boys club, non-inclusive, unsafe for women. Women work in administrative and clerical roles. Are they familiar? That's our industry. So what's more interesting is 30 years ago, Areola examined re-emergence of women in the American workforce post-World War II and called construction a non-traditional field. She, Ariora also traced the development of sexual harassment law during the period between 1970 and 1985 and reported sexual harassment in the industry towards women who had taken traditionally male occupied positions. Now, in 2020, my colleague, Sarah Hodsworth at RMIT studied uh, Australian workforce and also some of our colleagues in um, Zimbabwe studied uh, the industry and found a spectrum of negative incidents ranging from gender discrimination to sexual assault in our industry. So um, plethora of studies over the past three decades looked into this and investigated barriers and challenges. Um, the industry still has a bad reputation. So we argue that a holistic investigation of the pipeline is required. Um, research literature suggests that patching the leaky academic pipeline is the solution. And some researchers argue that, well, patching the leaky career pipeline is the solution. Um, but we argue that a holistic approach is required and particularly we have um, published, uh, it's going to be published next week, this conference, OBR 2023 conference. We brought this argument in this conference paper. Um, in this study, we are doing a mixed method approach. We are quantitative data and also qualitative data from literature and practice document of all four countries were investigated in this early stage. And we particularly did a desk research approach. We are collecting existing data from official statistics and national agencies, and also from some universities. Uh, our next stage that we already conducted, um, we contacted government departments and collected further data. And um, we are in the process of finalizing gender pay gaps and also leadership data, which I'm not going to talk about them in today's presentation. Um, and uh, the research is ongoing. Now, if we look at the education pipeline and undergraduate data, this is what it looks like. Uh, architectural and related services is a female-dominated degree program consistently throughout the years in both countries, Australia and USA. Civil engineering is popular program in the USA compared to Australia across the years. Um, construction engineering and management degree programs have a similar enrollment percentage across the years ranging from eight to 15%. However, Australia has a slightly higher enrollment percentage. And then going back to the previous slide where I showed you about the uh, uh, female representation in the industry, 11% is, is female. There are slight variations in the average percentages across the four countries where it range from say 9% to 13% in, um, in uh, Australia, it's around 12%. Now, uh, potential leaks from higher education to industry are very evident. And we also looked at occupational categories. So um, unsurprisingly, around 82 to 84% in the range, clerical and administrative workers were there. And only 11% in Australia and 14% in the US say we had management positions. And Technicians and trades workers were 2% in both countries. What we did then was to look at 
um, other industries. So first we un uh, went through comparable industries and then we also looked at best performing industries, for example, education and human health. So uh, they are generally traditional fields for working women. About 70 to 80% in education and human health had a female representation. There, the reason why we looked at this was there might be some uh, interesting char characteristics and policies in these fields that we can learn from eventually. And then comparable industries with construction, such as agriculture, manufacturing, transportation, mining was looked into. Um, construction industry showed the lowest representation in all three countries. Mining the second lowest representation. However, mining industry in the UK showed a, a increasing trend. Transportation industry is the third highest female representation. Agriculture and manufacturing sectors showed a mixed result across the countries, whereas they showed the highest female representation across the three countries. Well, when I looked at the literature, transportation um, and mining were criticized in the literature generally, but I'm really sorry, but our industry, construction industry is the worst in performance in terms of female representation according to our findings. Now, um, the research, my, my research is not interested to investigate efforts in, in um, invest efforts in investigating the issues and challenges to gender equality in the construction industry because there's a plethora of literature studies in this investigating these challenges. I have sort of uh, listed some of them and there are more to include. This research aimed to shed some lights on holistic understanding of these issues globally and systematically analyze them um, with the theoretical underpinning with the objective to assist the industry to overcome them effectively. Understanding interrelationships of these root causes throughout the pipeline with the gendered lens is our objective. And some of the challenges span across the whole pipeline and some are unique to one segment, but with complex interrelationships. So I'm not gonna talk about all these issues that I have on this slide, um, but to illustrate the complexity of these issues, I'll pick an example as I have highlighted in blue here. If we look at sexism and issues related to informal recruitment reported in literature itself, it's a complex issue. So um, one of the earliest barriers women face is the lack of access to informal network, networks, which men use to gain entry to the industry. And the fact that these networks remain exclusively for men is a concern. The prospects of joining are further weakened by poor career advices that's related to school careers counseling that brings another complexity and male dominance in training and recruiting word of mouth recruitment or merit based recruitment process being pro recruitment process being informal and lacking transparency and similarly literature argued that gender based discriminatory recruitment practices are more favorable for men than women. Due to high level of outsourcing in the industry for economic gains, construction companies have a high dependence on contractors who are mostly experienced male workers making entry harder for women. Another interesting angle literature brings is while women could have more educational qualifications than men, the recruitment decisions are taken mostly by male workers who themselves possess more experience and therefore value, value experience over education. So some companies are reported to be ignoring equality policies and recruiting only men to avoid policy and practice changes of recruiting women. Continuing traditional recruitment practices, um, recreating a male workforce, intolerance for career breaks, and unpaid or nominally pay apprenticeships are further reasons that create access barriers for women. 
our objective in this ongoing research is understanding those root causes stemming from work environments, individual factors, and to link them with behavior theories and social learning theories to de derive innovation and holistic strategies for the betterment. So um, some of the strategies that literature suggests, as well as um, some practice efforts are um, illustrated here. So general classification of these are around, let's fix the women, or let's fix the industry, or let's fix the education culture. So fixing women involve educating, or training, upskilling, empowering, and supporting Australia, uh, not only in Australia, I think around the world, we have this NAVIC, National Association of Women in Construction. Even in the USA, they are very active. And in the UK, they support professionally and personally. They are doing a massive uh, support uh, uh, structure and also create uh, um, an environment that's uh, empowering and supporting the women in construction. They've, they've set a target uh, their goal is uh, to achieve 25% in 2025, Australia in particular. I think it's a little bit ambitious though. Um, let's look at the fix in the industry. So culture change is it's a must, it's required. Um, so a lot of suggestions are there about strategies with the focus on fixing the industry. Now, uh, some practical examples are coming from Australia. Construction Industry Culture Task Force is setting some standards to include this culture change into procurement. And also Australian Contractors Association has pledged workplace flexibility policies. Um, and then fixing the education culture, also uh, talking about academia to focus its efforts on recruiting and retaining women. For example, linking with careers counselors and also um, make industry more visible to high schools and so on. Now, uh, our research, stage two of our research is uh, it's aiming to explore and compare the wide spectrum of drivers. To, uh, for gender diversity ranging from policies, regulations, uh, guidelines to industry and organizational practices. So I thought I'll touch base on the existing policies uh, in Australia, Australia particularly. So we have um, uh, legislation passed by federal government in 2012, which is called Workplace Gender Equality Act. Um, there is uh, an agency called the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, uh, which is an Australian government statutory agency created by the Act. Uh, and there are six gender equality indicators that they are reporting and compliance requirement in a annual scorecard. And recently, there was an amendment passed by federal parliament in March 2023, particularly looking at closing the gender pay gap. Um, so that tells us that gen closing the gender pay gap is a strategic um, priority. Um, and then particularly about building construction sector, we have a state level policy called building equality policy. And um, it's uh, around uh, building equality through procurement. So it applies to all publicly funded construction projects valued at 20 million or more. And it's uh, it has been through a transition period from 2022 to 2023. And from January, 2024, it's gonna be mandated. And it has three action items. Uh, meet uh, project specific gender equality targets and engage women as apprentices and trainees. And third is implement gender equality action plans. So this uh, policy has had been stemming from women in construction strategy 2019 to 2022, again, a, a state level strategy. Now, uh, action item three is obviously coming from our federal um, equality act. Action item one is somewhat interesting. I'd like to uh, draw your attention into that. It has specific gender equality targets. So uh, 
3% of the contract works should be from women. So it's uh, in trade sector. 3% of total estimated labor hours. So this is particularly about labor hours that may have some implications to pay gaps. And then non-trade um, sector 7% target and management and supervisory sectors 35% targets. Now, this is hot off the press and this, this came out, this news came out uh, just this week. Leadership roles in Australian workforce, um, part-time workers are encountering a promotional, promotion cliff. That was the title. There's a large gap in promotion opportunities for women and men who don't work full-time. Female dominated industries employ the highest number of part-time managers. So um, Workplace Gender Equality Agency tells us that 21% employees work in part-time roles and only 7% management roles are filled by part-time workers. The share of managers working part-time drops with seniority. Only 5% of key management personnel and only 3% of CEOs work part-time. So what does this tell us in a sector where women are heavily underrepresented? So women generally tend to go part-time. So the so family-friendly policy, there's a family-friendly impact on family-friendly workforce and um, work-life balance related, um, there's direct implications in it. And it'll be interesting to see um, how our construction sector perform in this aspect. So um, I believe that our um, leadership, investigation into leadership um, will, be able, will, ab will be able to tell us more about this. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about my experiences uh, with IEEE Women in Engineering. So they are more around engagement and impact initiatives. Um, I have lots of pictures to share here. So um, IEEE, it stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. So it's the world's largest technical professional organization and IEEE has over 427,000 members in more than 190 countries. IEEE Victoria has 2,000 members. So I am currently leading the IEEE Victoria Women in Engineering section. And um, this, uh, we are reporting to IEEE Victorian section and Women in Engineering headquarters. So in 2022, IEEE Women in Engineering celebrated 25th anniversary. A uh, few years ago, IEEE celebrated um, 100th year anniversary, so century. So we are pretty much like uh, 75 years younger. Um, and we celebrated it with panel discussion. And pretty much in IEEE Women in Engineering, we celebrate key days. We do some um, activities to give away to the community. And this is very fulfilling that we uh, pave the path for future generations. We celebrate International Women's Day, Women in Engineering Day, IEEE Women in Engineering Day, and so on. So what we do, the activities we do, we collaborate a lot. So we collaborate, our collaboration and collaborative networks are shown in this slide. So as you can see, we collaborate with IEEE other chapters, young professionals and antenna and propagation sector or uh, computer science or any other student chapters in universities. And also we um, collaborate with uh, other professional associations like Engineers Australia and um, and we work with community, we work with industry, universities, government, and also we work with high schools and particularly these school outreach programs uh, we do. We work with high schools and in, in some aspects, we train uh, high school teachers as well to embed some curriculum into their school teaching. And there's a new um, 
agenda for reaching out to primary schools where we want to sort of dilute some of our workshops to um, suit to primary schools. And also we work with other game changers such as RoboGirls and STEM Sisters, whoever who approaches us will start uh, collaborating with them um, as well. So these are some of the pictures of some activities we de did around mentoring and networking and educational tour we conducted um, uh, where we uh, demonstrated a world-class facility at RMIT, which is called the Micro Nano Fabrication Research Facility. And um, in here, there are some pictures from high school engagement activities which we used to empower and um, raise awareness of uh, high school children of career pathways and the sort of support available and so on. And this is some, these are some examples of technical skill development activities we conducted. Um, this is mainly to upskill women. We designed some workshops around something attractive to women. Obviously, we had to select something attractive. It's called electronic textiles. So we let we taught them how to program. We taught them how to uh, do an hands-on activities and develop some tangible product. So uh, some of the workshops we had uh, school teachers coming into and learning from us, and they took took away those learnings to uh, teach the high school children in, in embed them into their curriculum. There was something interesting happened last year. We did a workshop in um, biomedical engineering conference in Melbourne and majority of the participants were men in that workshops. Um, this is my favorite activity. Um, that was during National Science Week. We conducted series of workshops around e-textiles, again, as you can see in this top right-hand side pictures. And then in the end, we uh, facilitated a competition for them to develop something uh, in it as a tangible product and to show, it's called Fashion Runway, forced workshops on National Science Week, we did that. And also we, um, uh, designed a large workshop ranging um, at various skill levels that suits the primary school children, senior, uh, high school children, as well as general public, uh, a general public workshop. So um, this was mainly to um, uh, sort of raise awareness and get the general public to uh, try out this technology and um, sort of, um, link with the, uh, the uh, to have a flavor, have a flavor of this technology and to also, especially for high school girls or even uh, primary school girls to um, show what's around and get them to try out the technology and so on. I, I'm not sure with the, the time permits, I have a video here with the, I'm not sure with the, Technically, it's feasible, but um, this has nothing to do with construction. Um, Cole and Paul, do you know whether I can play this here? Um, yeah, you should be able to. Okay. So um, th this has nothing to do with construction, but it is an example of how we engage with general public and make technology visible to general public in an attractive manner, particularly to females. So this is a, a video from that exhibition I mentioned, e-textiles. <laughs> So the workshop participants 
develop something, they learn the skills, they develop something and um, exhibit them on that day. So that's the sort of, um, uh, that's what it is about. And then this is a new project um, where IEEE Women in Engineering, RMIT University and Australian Federal Government uh, funded project uh, as a collaboration. Uh, this, is, this federal funding is to build um, aspirations for female school students and other underrepresented groups in STEM. This project is run in collaboration uh, with RMIT's outreach programs, so including incursions and excursions su such as uh, regional roadshows. So main idea and main objective is to give school students hands-on experience on some of these um, technologies. Um, so that's pretty much all. And I'd like to conclude uh, the presentation with some key messages. So as we discussed, um, research and practice over 30 years are of limited effectiveness and root cause analysis and interrelationships need to be investigated. And in this investigation of strategies to overcome such challenges should consider the entire pipeline and what failed over three decades should give us lessons learned to improve. And um, also innovative approaches are needed. For example, work practices and nature of work in our industry is changing. So for example, in, as a result of industrial revolution construction 4.0, uh, it's becoming less manually intense and uh, less labor intense and automation uh, and robotics and AI and all sorts of technology is available and there will be opportunities to be safer for both men and women. Um, and the, the change of uh, nature of work and workplace has uh, massive implications to attract women. So, um, and also, we argue that cross-sectorial collaboration is vital. So professional bodies, uh, universities, industry, and other stakeholders, government and policymakers should come together. Um, I think CIB is doing uh, great initiatives in this space. They have various new schemes, future leaders, student chapters, ECR network, VISTAS program, and also there's a new one visiting Global Scholar, but I believe there are room to improve. Um, um, and also there is enough criticism for our industry and we need to now share best practices globally. Learning from other countries is important and learnings from other industries is also vital. Um, and also innovative approaches are needed for the structure change. Change of structure in the industry is a must. It's, it's not optional, it's a must. Um, but that change should happen through innovative approaches. So there's a debate around um, which approach works and we don't have sufficient data yet. We have to um, get empirical data in our next stages to, to support these arguments better. But this criticism about, uh, the, however, there's criticism about formal institutions, they are inherently gendered because research argued that formal institutional rules are inherently gendered and lack of robustness and revisability in policy design is a key factor influencing the lack of uh, progress in improving women's representation. So uh, there are arguments around, uh, should we include both top-down and bottom-up measure, bottom measures in that case? And then also on the other hand, um, there are arguments around are the targets enough? For example, in Victoria, 3% target. Is that enough, good enough? Or should we go for radical changes, such as 40% quotas that uh, uh, simulate in Norway? Um, and then we need to look at legislations, what works. And, um, and also researchers and practitioners debate around simply saying 3% increase um, without a formal structure and support and targeting 3% um, is not sufficient. And where are we gonna get these females? So these are the things that we need to uh, carefully think 
and unpack. And definitely there's a labor shortage in the industry and we are building more and more infrastructure and policy has a big role in uh, providing that support structure. So effectiveness of the policy is under-researched. Now, um, where are we heading? Um, we have completed the ethics approval for human research and we have recruited the industry advisory board members from countries. And we have just started the interview process. Um, we also uh, finished looking into the gender pay gaps um, data. Well, I didn't have permission for my uh, statistical quant quantitative analysis experts to share it today because we need to tidy up some of the data. And we are also looking into leadership positions. Um, now our next stage is to investigate this um, wide spectrum of drivers, policies and practices and the effectiveness and the, the, the innovative ways of uh, developing these strategies. And as a result, finally, we would like to aim uh, to develop best practice guidelines for the industry. So that's our ultimate goal of this research study. Hopefully it can contribute to uh, a uh, systematic, systemic change in the industry. Um, that's pretty much all uh, from my end. Am I uh, on time? If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Ravini, that was, that was excellent. Uh, a really uh, wonderful knowledge and experience that you have shared and uh, a lot of great information about uh, what is the status of women in engineering. Uh, particularly in the construction industry, and you also touched upon IEEE. Uh, so indeed, please give her a big round of applause. Thank you for I, the kind words. So I, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. Uh, so if you have a question, please uh, uh, open your mic and, and ask. Unfortunately, I cannot see everybody on my screen. So you'll have to uh, just open your mic and ask a question, please. So while people are thinking, let me start with a question I had. And, uh, you know, you, you, you talked about uh, you know, different things that need to be fixed, particularly, uh, you know, how to fix the industry, how to fix the, uh, you know, the education system and how to fix the culture. But from your experience and from your research, uh, what would you suggest? Where, where should one start? What is the right place to start so that it becomes easier to then handle the other issues that, uh, also need to be taken care of. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very good question because it's it's all over the place. Things are uh, throughout the pipeline. People think le it's leaking here, it's leaking there. And that's why I, I think uh, it's required in uh, great effort into collating these, um, all these efforts and flip those challenges into uh, into effective strategies. So systematic understanding of these strategies holistically is the starting place. And the other one is key thing is um, even the little steps that you can do, like the things that we do in IEEE, um, anyone can contribute in their capacity to give away to the community. So I think um as a, if i if i'm talking to cib cib has a different role if as individuals in this industry each and each and every one of us have a uh, have a role to play as well. so looking at informal institutions for example norms becomes practices and practices be become constructs so everyone each and every one of us have certain beliefs and certain norms and they lead to practices. So I think change should happen bottom up through norms by changing through norms to practices and to constructs. But top down, bigger organizations and big players and bigger influences a different role to, to, to uh, implement this stronger policy and uh, enable the top down and bottom up both to come together. That's my opinion. 
Uh, thank you, Rogini. In, indeed, uh, you touched upon norm becomes practice. I think that is uh, very true. Uh, just to follow up on that question, uh, it, does your research support or does it suggest that uh, you know, having a champion at an organization uh, that would promote uh, you know, uh, the women role participation in the industry, do you think that works uh, effectively or is more effective rather? Uh, women role, uh, could you repeat that please, Mark? Uh, so, so what I was saying was that in, in you know much of the research that we do for like the Construction Industry Institute, uh, one thing that comes out is that if you have a champion in the organization, some, some in senior person who could uh, promote and uh, take charge of uh, changing the culture, then it really uh, works faster, you know, whatever you're trying to implement. The best practice. So, it does. Has your research shown uh, that that is a good practice also for increasing women in engineering and particularly construction? Uh, yeah, literature suggests that uh, leadership has a massive role. So, uh, in changing um, formal uh, policies and practices and norms, eventually, um, leaders and executive leaders in an organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are key drivers for this change, according to the literature. So we are yet to unpack, and um, in our through our empirical data, we are yet to unpack that matter a little bit more to uh, look at the interrelationships. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going back to the audience now. If anybody has a question, you know, please open your mic and, and ask ask a question. We have many participants from around the world, so I'm sure there must be some pressing questions that reflect on their part of the, of the world. Any questions? I'm, I'm scrolling through my screen here to see if anybody has raised hand. <laughs> Well, so while, while you're thinking, let me, let me continue with our- uh, uh, Can I just come in, Mark? Yes, yes, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. 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 Uh, I think, yeah. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 Didibugu, yeah. we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. No, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, uh, quite a nice one, quite insightful. So I think many of the things that we've talked about, it also apply. So myself, I'm based in South Africa. So just what I want to ask with regard to your program of the high school engagement, how effective is the typical program where you're going to see, a, I mean, the female student uh, actually going to the built environment? Have you done some assessment? So with regard to the PECA program that you talk about the high school engagement. Okay. Um, so I think you are referring to the high school engagement I mentioned in Women in Engineering. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, 100%. Yes. Yeah. So um, in our experience, we haven't collected statistics or numbers about how many enrolled because it requires a longitudinal work over the years. For example, we conducted the workshops and then we have to, uh, over time, collect statistics about how many came into the industry and so on. But in a nutshell, in um, what we experienced and observed was after taking workshops, for example, the school teachers, um, they took away that curriculum and implemented in schools to the children. And uh, it became a formal part of the school curriculum. So I believe that way, uh, the visibility of those tasks were in their curriculum already. So what my uh, observation is, even though we don't have numbers about how many of them came into engineering as a result of these workshops, it, ge it generate opportunities for school girls to try them out. And, and during the school curriculum, they can try them out and they, they become more competent and more interested in these um, areas. So uh, looking at the built environment sector, I believe at least in Australia, even uh, speaking from my own experience, my son did careers counseling last year and um, 
even for um, male, female both, they didn't pay much emphasis for uh, construction as a career choice. So it's not seen as a visible career. Obviously for female, uh, it's not in the list and it's not visible. And if it was in the school curriculum somehow, there are people at early stage, women tend to think that, oh, okay, there's a career pathway for me in this in, uh, in construction sector. I should look for options. So I think that's missing at this stage. Thank you, Dilipuku, for that uh, question. I think that was very interesting. Uh, uh, any other participants with questions, please open your mic. I'm scrolling down my screen just to see you don't miss anybody. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Majid, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, did you do a survey where you asked uh, female, like uh, high school females, where they are, where they are interested in uh, construction, like in jobs in the future? And if they said like, no, what's the reason behind that? Uh, answer is no. I haven't actually uh, surveyed uh, high school children. Um, about I think there are some studies around, uh, general studies around why they don't come into general engineering sector, but I think there's an opportunity for somebody to undertake similar similar study yeah. high school children's but there's there's literature already around not with high school children thank you Majid um, anybody else we have just about a couple of minutes left uh, if anybody has a pressing question okay. please who is this okay. uh, this is Ali yeah Ali go ahead please uh, yes, so I had a question that may be a bit, you know, out of the box in the presentation, but during the pandemic, uh, countries with female leaders were actually more successful in the pandemic response. So uh, what are some of the trends of the pandemic uh, that made that happen? So does, does your research reveal some of those trends, maybe highlighting them and focusing on that can be an effective way uh, to have even at, at such high levels. I'm really sorry, Ali. I couldn't hear you well. Okay, let me try and. Yeah. Your question was around pandemic time. Females were more successful, if I, if I got it correct. Yes. Let me repeat again. So during the pandemic, uh, countries with female leaders were actually more successful in, in pandemic response, like New Zealand. So what are the, some of the skills of women uh, that made that happen? And does your research uncover some of that? How how highlighting those strengths can be you know, having more successful work? Anecdotally, and I didn't do any research into looking into why it was successful, but and, and during pandemic, but anecdotally reading. Um, I believe it's work-life balance matter. For example, um, uh, I can't speak from personal experience, though I don't. I didn't have research evidence for that. For example, when we go to works, there's a lot of time invested in um, in the roads or some un underground preparation and all sorts of other matters. So, but at home, they are more effective multitasking and. Work-life balance has been much better and much uh, um, productive, I guess. That could be the reason. I don't have, again, I don't have research evidence to uh, back it up, Ali. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank, thanks for that question. So we are almost uh, out of time. So, you know, I, I always take the uh, privilege of asking the last question. So let me pose my last question, uh, and which is that, uh, you know, in your research that you shared with everybody, you know, shows that there's much happening in Australia, and uh, but I was wondering, 
based on your research, what have you found? Uh, how how is it in other countries, uh, and what can perhaps other countries learn from uh, the steps that Australia has taken in encouraging more women in engineering, and particularly in the built environment? So, Mark, um, I can't conclude that Australia is doing better by saying that we had some policies because um, I didn't share the gender pay gaps, for example. Um, I'm just uh, step, stepping ahead here. For example, gender pay gaps, data tells us that we are not do, performing well. So, um, we can't conclude. That's why we are planning to do the second stage of this study to actually talk to practitioners and um, unpack the current practices and policies and the effectiveness, and uh, then to uh, to create a learning a platform for all the countries to learn from each other. So yeah, we have policies. In place. Effectiveness of the policies is not is not known yet so as i said people argue yeah we have a three percent target to have tradeswomen on the sector um but is it actually effective so we had this policy for 2012 10 years now it's it's only in, increased one percent for example the, the and also in 2020 we have evidence that there it's not safe for yet so um, I don't know whether we can conclude we are learning we, whether other countries can learn from Australia yet, because this this argument around three percent is too small. Isn't it? Somebody could argue that, for example, gender quotas in Norway is much better. Radical change is better than baby steps. And at the same time, um, yeah, there are things we can learn, for example, gender equality agency reporting schemes and, and from next year, from now onwards, uh, the recent federal budget, um, the pass of the act, um, gender pay gap data are going to be publicly available from next year onwards. Things like that, probably we can learn. So that's why we wanted to collect all these practices and policies in the coming, uh, half a year or so to create the uh, data to create uh, um, doc we want to document all these best practices for all other countries to learn from each other thank you Ravin uh, I think that was a very wonderful and very thought provoking uh, seminar and uh, in indeed we are all looking forward to the results that, that you and your team generate uh, not only during the first stage of the project, but also the second and the following stages that, that you have mentioned. I think that is indeed going to be very useful for uh, the entire industry uh, around the world. And particularly, you know, through CIB, we can promote some of these uh, results uh, for members to benefit. Having said that, thank you again very much for taking time. And, and those who are in the audience, you know, please note that uh, Dr. Edir Singh is giving this seminar live at 3.30 in the morning. So <laughs> that is indeed a, a, a wonderful effort. And, and uh, Ruvini, we really appreciate that. So please open your mic and give a big round of applause if you all, please. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you. Awesome thank you all and, and those who are in the audience, we look forward to seeing you again uh, we will not be having a seminar next Friday, but the Friday after. Uh, thanks. Have a good weekend. Uh, and those who are having Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving to all. Bye. Thank Have a lovely you. day, everyone.